Father, today in this place, I ask that you would do way beyond what I can do as a teacher, as a communicator. Holy Spirit, we need your help to speak and touch every person that hears this message today, that the Word of God, which is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, is able to change us, to shape us, to sculpt us, to mold us, to encourage us, to help us along in our journey. And we know you're going to do these things because we've gathered in your presence, and you can do it. So we trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We've been taking a look at the cause, the one cause, say one cause, that you and I were created, and then really the cause that we have come to this place in time is to preach the gospel. Regardless of who we are, Jesus knew that. Jesus had an effective ministry. How many think that's true? All right. Before you were born, Father God knew you, he destined you, he purposed you, and we've been talking about that for the past few weeks. Jeremiah 1.5, it said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. And so we've been talking about what that means to not only us as individuals, but us as a corporate body of believers here at Resurrection Life Church. If you're a guest or a visitor, just take our message today and apply it to the church that you're part of. God's really been speaking to us that it's so important that we're surrendered to one cause and the cause of Christ, not only individually, but as a body, and how important it is for us to be surrendered to that body, that vision, that local church, to be able to make an impact, because all of us together can make a greater impact than we could on our own. It says this in Psalm 133, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil upon the head running down the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. God commands his blessing where there's unity. And disunity can come in so many different ways. Of course, we always think about fighting and quarreling. But disunity can happen when you and I don't know our purpose, don't know our call, don't know the cause that we came to the earth in this very time in history. When we're not surrendered to that, we can literally hinder the body of Christ. The Bible says clearly that each one of us has a part to fulfill. And so it's important that we know what that purpose is. Now, last week we talked about the fact that time has a purpose, and we talked about seasons and how many times life goes in seasons. How many have noticed that? And how we found out that there's certain seasons to plant, there's certain seasons for us to cultivate and to, to water, and there's certain seasons to wait. How many like waiting? Probably none of us, but there's seasons that we wait, and then there's a harvest. And you can apply that to every single area in our lives. And so it's important that we realize that time has a purpose. Ecclesiastes 3.1, it says, to everything... There's a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. Galatians 4, 4 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Now, it's, it's clear to those of us who have studied time and the Word of God that Jesus wasn't born for some 4,000 years after the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. If I was God, I would have come and taken care of it right there. But God knew at the fullness of time, say fullness, that that was the perfect time for Jesus to be born, to be able to do the redemptive work that he provided for you and I, and all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so God had a better plan, and so we need to realize if God's season for perfection can take 4,000 years to come to pass for Jesus, then, well, we don't have 4,000 years, but you get the picture. that No matter what season we're in in our life, God has specifically ordained our life And sometimes, you know, there's mistakes we've made. There's choices that we've made that have caused us to get off course a little bit. But listen, don't bit yourself under shame. Don't let the devil beat you up. Don't think that God can't perform his will in your life just because you got off track a little bit. If you realize the season, say season, then you know that God can do everything he needs to do to perfect the work that he's doing in you. See, nothing about God is futile or unconsequential. Everything God does has a purpose. God knows, doesn't wait to answer our prayers just so he can make us feel uncomfortable, just so he can watch us squirm. If we think that, we have a distorted view of who God is. He's a good father who loves us, who wants nothing but good things for us. Again, even if we get off track, don't let the enemy spoil the love of the Father in your life. So many times we can think, well, God's mad at me. God's holding out on me. Why doesn't God hear my prayers? Regardless of where you are in the season 
of getting your fulfilled prayer answered, don't allow the devil to lie to you and to steal the goodness of Father God. God's good no matter what. And see, Jesus was very clear. He said, don't seek the things the Gentiles seek. Seek the kingdom of heaven first, and all the things you need would be added to you. He talked about the birds of the heavens. He talked about the flowers, how they don't toil, they don't spin, but they have a perfect season to be productive. And so you and I need to rest in God. We need to get used to resting in God. I talked about last week how I tried to hurry uh, grow my lawn along and how I was ready to take out the garden rake at a place that I gr- gr- uh, planted some new grass and boy if I, if I would have ripped it up I would have spent extra money ripping that thing up. But I waited, say wait and now I've got more grass than I wish I had to mow there. And so, you know, uh, it's just important that we realize that the, the season that we're in, God will use that to grow us, to enlarge us, to increase us. And we're going to talk about that this morning. God wants to increase our capacity. So don't ever dismiss the value of time. In fact, John four thirty four, Jesus said, it's my food to fulfill God's will and to finish the work that he has set before me. Listen, we can actually become nourished by fulfilling the Word of God. You and I have got to realize that there is a purpose for everything that comes into our life. Now, this morning, I want to talk about the topic of prosperity. If we don't understand uh, that God has called us to one cause, to preach the gospel to the lost, if we don't understand that we're supposed to be part of a body of believers, and we also don't understand that God wants to increase us and prosper us in every area of our lives, not only individually but corporately, if we don't understand that, it will hinder us from fulfilling the call that God has placed in our lives. Now, anyone who reads the Bible knows that prosperity is, in fact, a word that encompasses so much more than money and wealth. So I just want to just remove that from your head this morning. It certainly includes money, all right? And it's very important because many people have really hang-ups when it comes to money. I mean, we'll talk about money, worry about money, try to steal money, get money any way we can. But if the preacher talks about it on Sunday, all he wants is my money. <laughs> Why don't you just loosen that grip a little bit? All right. I was speaking to somebody. <laughs> Probably somebody on the Internet. Certainly no one that's in this room this morning. <laughs> But let's just take a look at what the word prosper means, the Greek definition of prosper. It means to be granted a long journey, an easy way, or to be successful. God wants us to be successful. Do you believe that this morning? He wants you to be successful in the line of work that you do. And again, we've talked about this for the past few weeks. Not everybody's called to five-fold pulpit ministry to be a teacher, pastor, evangelist, apostle, those types of things. But every one of us is called to prosper and to be successful in whatever area of life that we're in to be able to be a blessing to the body of Christ and a blessing to the world in which we live. The Hebrew definition of prosper means this. It means to make progress, to exceed, to succeed and be profitable, to show or experience prosperity. As a noun, it means this, ease and quietness as it relates to peace and abundance. Another definition is help for the journey. How many need help for the journey that you're on? See, prosperity is the help that we need for the journey that we're on. Again, even though it includes money, it's not just about money. However, the way we look at money, the view of finances has a great deal to do with our prosperity because really the way we look at money and and, and understanding or not understanding its purpose will skew the success that we see in every area of our lives. Because we will trust our money, we'll trust our things, we'll trust ourself, and God will not be able to move to the fullest of his ability. In fact, you know this, in in Psalm 78, verse 40, 78, verse 41, it says that the children of Israel hindered the Holy One of Israel. Forty years they were in the desert for an 11-day journey, and they hindered God. You know you can hinder God? You and I can hinder God by the way we view things and skew the whole plan of God for our life. Again, we can get back on track, but we... Get back on track by changing our minds and starting to see things the way God sees it. So it's important that we understand what prosperity means. It's important that we understand how it really attaches to our finances, but how it really affects every area of our life. Third John 2, he says this. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things, say all things, 
and be in health just as your soul prospers. We cannot have true prosperity in any area of our life if our soul is not prospering. What does it mean for your soul to prosper? It can mean a lot of things, but let me just say this simply. It means peace. It is well with my soul. It is well. Listen, if you're worried about how to pay the bills, how to save this much money for retirement, how to do this, how to do that, how to buy this, how to get the kids through school, how to get that house, how to get that. If you, you do not have peace in your soul, all right? And, and I understand life has lots of challenges and opportunities, and, and we certainly, again, need to be wise with our money, and it's not bad to invest. In fact, it's smart. The Bible says we should. We talked last week about how generosity really has uh, two parts to it. One part, we need to manage what we have properly, but then we need to release it too. So we can't be generous people. We can't be a generous body of believers unless we first manage what we have well and then are willing to release what God has given us. Again, if we don't do that, we're trusting ourselves. We're trusting how we gain the income, the money that we have. And if we look at money that way, we will not have peace in our soul. I don't care how much you get. You will not have it. See, prosperity has a purpose However, it's conditional, again, on the way we view our life, how we view the life that God has called us to. Now, I'm going to read quite a few verses out of Matthew 25, and I just want you to follow along with me, and then we're going to talk a little bit about this story, familiar to some of us. Starting in Matthew 25, verse 14, I want to read through verse 30 in the New King James Version. Matthew 25, he says this, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods, I want you to remember his servants and his goods, to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another he gave one, and to another according to his ability, and immediately he went on his journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Verse 20. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered me five talents. Look, I've gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Now, many people know that Jesus is going to say, well done, good and faithful servant, but many people don't realize it's attached to this scripture. All right, we're going to read on. I'm going to meddle and get someone upset. Verse 22. He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I've gained two more talents. Understand in this story, a talent is a sum of money. We were very clear that he gave them money to manage. Yes, God has given us gifts and talents, and we've talked about that, but this is talking about money. Say money. money. There, now we're all on the same page. He says, well done. What, what verse was I at? Verse 22. He says, you delivered me two talents. Look, I've gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and he said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown, and that I gather where I have not scattered seed, so you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. In fact, in one translation, which I think is probably a better translation, he said, you should at least have deposited it. There's many ways we can invest, and the best investment really is the kingdom of heaven. Again, we're talking about finances, the way we manage finances, the way we release finances. Verse 28. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has more will be given, and he will have abundance. But to him who does not have, even what he has, or some translations say what he think he has, will be taken away. And cast an unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, the five talents doubled his to, to ten. The two doubled his to four. But the one hid, and get this, this is a picture of the Lord, all right? God loves us, but understand, he will take from the one who did not do well and give it to the one who already had 10 because he managed it well, all right? So it's important the way we manage what God has given to us. Two servants took what they had. They prospered with it. They used what was in their hands and in their understanding to be able to prosper 
and they understood that prosperity had a purpose. God gives us gifts. God gives us abilities, blessing, and they're all potential to have answered prayer in our lives in the, answer, in the area of prosperity. Uh, don't bury those gifts. And let me just say this. Realize that the one who had one, the one who had two, and the one who had five were not really, God did not expect them to multiply the same as the other two. He expected them to multiply according to their ability. I want to be clear of that. Because so many times we say, well, you know, Pastor, when I win the lottery, I'll give half to the church. Well, not if you have 10 in your wallet and won't give five. That's just the truth, all right? Whether it's church or helping to feed the hungry or whatever it might be. But see, we have this attitude that when we have a lot, then we'll be generous. Not true. Statistics prove, as a matter of fact, that when be pe people become more wealthy, they become less generous. And I, I, that shocks us, but there's statistics. Again, there's statistics. You can find a statistic for just about anything. But I've checked this out in and, and several different places, talked to several people, and, and it's true in so many ways. Now, not everybody who accumulates wealth and, and prospers becomes ungenerous or greedy, but many times it happens. And some of the most generous people are people in what we would call uh, middle income or even lower than middle income are some of the most generous people. Statistics, again, show us that. So what you won't do with what you have, you will not do if you have more. Can I get an amen? amen? See, God may have a different perspective of your gift than you do. I think he has a much better perspective of our gift. He sees us in light of eternity. He sees us in light of having no sin. He sees us perfect. We have a hard time with that. So even though he may see it differently than we do, than we do, God wants to enable us. He wants to add exceeding abundance to the gifts and the abilities that he's given us. He wants to take our natural and turn it into supernatural. But for us to be able to experience that in our life, we've got to be willing to do what God's called us to do and to release things that he's given us. I remember some years ago, now remember, the, we just read that the Bible says clearly that it was God's money or the Lord's money and his ability. He gave to these men according to their ability. So it was God's money. Everything we have is his. We are managers of what God has given us. There is nothing that you and I have that's ours. I am not my own but I've been crucified with Christ. See, see, we are not our own. God bought us with a price. So the one thing we need to realize is that it doesn't belong to us. So if, if we take what God has given us and bury it, we are burying not what is ours, but burying what is his. And I remember this probably, um, my goodness, it's got to be 25 years ago just about. Trish and I uh, took a vacation. In fact, we, we lived in Grand Rapids area at the time, and we took a vacation, and we came up here, and we stayed at a little cottage in Duck Lake. Our kids will remember that, and Trish remembers that. And we came, and actually, when we were up here back then, God started to really speak to our heart about uh, really moving into Traverse City and starting a work and all those kinds of things. And, and a number of years later, he, he, he did that and was so faithful. But we, we came up, and I remember all we had was this little car, and I wasn't making a whole lot of money at the time, but we really wanted to go on vacation. And a pastor friend of mine, Bernie Blaukamp, some of you may know Bernie, a very good friend of mine, and, and he says, well, I got this van. You can take it for the week. And so we took the van. Trish, are you here? I saw you earlier. You remember this. Remember when we borrowed that van? It was one of them Astros. I remember the Ford, it was a Ford Astro. I think it's a Ford, isn't it? Yeah, it's Ford. No, it's not an Astro then. It's the Ford one. It's the one that's kind of square. And Aerostar, that's what it was, yeah. It was. So we got in that thing, and we packed our kids up. I don't even think Aaron was born yet. So, yeah, it had to be over 22 years ago. So it was just the two little littles, Selena and Tony. And then we, we headed north, and we had a great vacation that week. Man, the sunsets were beautiful, but, you know, it was Traverse City. Now, not like this summer. How many know it's hot this summer? But like typical Traverse City summer, it was cold. But we still had fun, and <laughs> we enjoyed it. And we enjoyed being on the lake with the kids and having campfires and all that stuff. Now, because I wanted to be a good steward of what was lent to me, of course, I brought that van back full of gas and washed. All right? And I wanted to be a good manager or a good steward of what was lent to me because I was thankful that it got me to vacation. Now, if Bernie would have given me the van and I would have just taken it, driven my family up here, said, boy, I don't know, I don't want to, I really don't want to 
hurt the van. I don't want to get in an accident. I don't, you know, maybe, maybe we just ought to leave it here, and I'm going to take the keys, and I'm going to bury it out here by Duck Lake, and we're just going to figure out a different way to get back home. And, and I'll just say, Bernie, I'm sorry about your van. I left it in Traverse City because I, I didn't want to use it because I was afraid of what might happen to it. He'd be looking at me like, did you take stupid pills? <laughs> oh, but, 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 but even more than that, it wasn't that I just left it there. I buried the keys. He'd look at me like, slap you upside your head. I mean, you see, and, but isn't that, but listen, that's what we do with the abilities that God gives us. That's what we do with the finances that God gives us. We're afraid to release it. Maybe God's brought us to an area in our lives where he's starting to prosper us, and we're starting to see the blessings of God. And our natural tendency would be, oh boy, and we just kind of pull back and start to experience those blessings, and then we forget about the fact that God loaned those things to us. I've seen this happen so many times over the years, so many times. James 1.17, it says this, Every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, in whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. See, the good things that you and I have in our life are given by God. And let me just say this, you're a good thing. You are a good thing. Turn to the person next to you. Say, you're a good thing. See, understand something. The issue in our lives is not what we do not have. Listen carefully. The issue is not what we do not have. The issue is what we will not give. Let that sink in. The issue is not what we don't have. It's what we will not give. We just read it, Matthew 25, 29. Jesus said, for everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. See, prosperity is not just about you. And let me just say this. It's not about being greedy. It's not about selfishness. All right? As a matter of fact, some people like to sound pious and say, well, I just don't believe in prosperity. I believe that God wants me to suffer for Jesus. Well, we should suffer for Jesus. All right? But God doesn't want us to live paycheck to paycheck. God doesn't want us to not be able to be a blessing. Again, it's different levels according to our ability, according to what we were given. Not everyone's called to be a millionaire. I'm not going to stand up here and say that. People like to say, well, you know, that's a prosperity uh, gospel, like it's something wicked or evil. Listen, there's only one gospel. (laughs) <laughs> and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he paid a price for you and I and has given gifts to us to be able to be a blessing and to preach the gospel. So there's no prosperity gospel. It's one gospel, and we're prospering in him. But we need to understand finances. We need to understand release. We need to understand managing. And we can't take God out of the equation. See, the selfish person is the one who keeps all of God's blessings for themselves, and hides it, all of the things that he's been given. See, we want to say, well, I just don't want to believe in prosperity. No, what we want to do is hold on to what we have. Listen, we are in partnership with God to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. See, I believe with all my heart that when you live below your potential, you're unable to do all that God has called you to do, all right? When we live below our potential. So as a church, if we don't believe that God wants to increase us, to reach out to be a blessing. That's why several times a year we reach out in our, our uh, uh, community here, and when we partner with the, the, the TCAPs and children who are in um, um, yeah, foster care. I can't think of the word there. Foster care for a number of years now. We've, we've helped them in so many ways. We've put bags together for children as they're taken out of a home and maybe moved into a safer place. Bags that just give them some, some things to help them feel settled. Uh, this is normal day-to-day things. We've, we've put together... Um, uh, coats and boots over the past couple of years. So many of our participate over the past couple of years, we've put more. We've put more than 500 coats and boots on children in the school system. I mean, that's pretty. That's pretty good for a little church of 200 people. Now we're not going to stay little forever because I was talking to Pastor Bernie, the same guy that I I borrowed the van from, and talking to him about that, and just uh, you know, he, he, I was telling him some of the outreaches we do, and I said, boy, you know, for a church our size, that's pretty good. He says that's because you have a vision that's larger than the church that you're in. He said, and you will continue to grow if you continue to do things like that. And so we need to continue to reach out because we need to believe in the blessings of God together. See, when we use all that God has given us, we ensure that we'll have enough to achieve all that we're supposed to. 
In fact, if we only think about ourselves, if our money and every area of prosperity is only about our peace and it doesn't reach out to others, the Bible, we just read it, calls us wicked and lazy. In case you forgot, verse 26, but the Lord answered and said, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. When we don't release what's been put into our hands and allow it to increase for the sake of the kingdom. Listen, everything Jesus talked about was the sake of the kingdom because he came for this one cause and he's created us for one cause. Say one cause. And so really it relates to it directly. He says if we don't release what God has given us to be a blessing to other people, he calls us wicked and lazy. I'm just delivering the message. I didn't write it. (laughs) In fact, when we say, stick with me, when we say that I don't have enough to help somebody else, we're calling God a liar. Because the Bible tells us not only in this parable, this is a good one, but shows us over and over again that we need to be generous. The generous soul will be watered himself. See, we need to live generous lives. And so it's not a a fact that we, we don't have something to help. God has given us enough to be able to help. Now, you and I may have reasons or excuses for our inaction. Uh, We might be fearful. In fact, I believe that fear is the number one reason people don't give, all right? Uh, In fact, um, if we can pull this up, it's not in our notes, but 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, I'm going to read in the New Living Translation, 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, it says, you know the generous grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make many rich. See, Jesus became poor to bless others. In fact, if you read this chapter, Paul the Apostle, just a couple of verses before that, he says that I am testing your love by measuring it with the other churches, talking about giving an offering to help those who are in Jerusalem. So he's showing us that we give out of love. Somebody once said this, and I think it's so true. You can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. And our motivation for giving is love. It's about love. All right? God has filled us with potential. And so many of us are fearful. We don't want to release. The Bible tells us in 1 John 4, 4, that perfect love casts out all fear. And so if we understand the love of God, then the fear that's trying to grip us can be removed so that we can be faithful with what God has given us so that he can give us more. When we're not faithful with what he's given us, it's like we're burying the keys to the van in Duck Lake mud. Is somebody with me? All right, so we can't live that way. Let me just encourage you this morning, don't be someone who's just saved. And that's it. You know, Jesus didn't save you just so you could be safe. Jesus saved you and called you, it says in 1 Timothy 1.9. You were saved and called. Say saved. saved. Say called. Oh. You have a purpose. You and I have a purpose together. And one of those purposes is really to honor God in the area of finances so that we can prosper in every area of our life. Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. What we sow, we will reap. All right? God wants people's lives to move forward and to enlarge in every area of our life. We just read 2 Corinthians 8 9, how Jesus became poor to make many rich. Look what it says in Deuteronomy 8 18, and you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Say, it's God that gives me ability to get wealth. Say, it's God. It gives me ability to get wealth. And he gives us that ability to establish his covenant, establishing his covenant with us. Remember, the covenant that we have is the covenant and the promise he made to Abraham that was fulfilled in Jesus, and he told Abraham that he was going to be blessed to be a blessing to the nations of the earth, and that didn't change. Jesus said, go into all the world and what? Preach the gospel. How many know it takes time, treasure, and talents to preach the gospel? It's getting awful quiet in here. And if we think we're just saved to come to a Sunday meeting like this and be entertained, well, you're in the wrong church because we don't believe that here. (laughs) Got even quieter. We believe that we're called here to be shaped, to be challenged, 
to realize what the Bible says so that we can get the mindset of God so we can live a life where we prosper in every area of our life, so we can reach out and be a blessing in the community that God has put us in. Listen, if we're just a church that gets together, and boy, we had a good show today, and wasn't that good? Pastor Tony, he waxed eloquently. And he preached really good, and he made me feel really good. Wasn't that nice? And, you know, they got up there, and they played that song note for note and didn't make any mistakes. And they all had perfect haircuts <laughs> and perfect clothes. Hey, I got new tennis shoes on today. If you've been here for the past couple of weeks, we're talking about shoes and how women wear a pair of shoes that look nice and carry comfortable ones in their purse. We're talking about that. Maybe not all women do that, but some that I know do that. So this, this week, Trish wanted some new tennis shoes, and so I bought a pair so she could get hers half off. So I wore them today. All right. Of course, my pair cost me 60 bucks, but whatever, you know. So I figured I'd wear them while they're still clean, all right, because they're going to get dirty. Shoes get dirty, right? <laughs> they just do. It's just, well, my shoes get dirty. Some people's shoes don't get dirty, but, okay, I'm meddling, so I'm going to stop that. So, see, the Bible is clear that God wants us to prosper financially. And understand, it's not about us being greedy or selfish when we want more, if our hearts are right, because God wants to increase us. God wants us to increase. Say, God wants me to increase. The Bible's very clear that the only time the money's bad is when we're in love with it. Then we become greedy. Then it's a problem. Read with me 1 Timothy 6.10. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Listen, when we love money, and the love of money will cause us to not love God and others as much, therefore we won't give the way we should because we love money and the perfect love of God has not moved out fear out of our lives, and so we don't live the way we should live. Some people say, well, you know, how could I be greedy? I don't have any. No, but you wish you had more, and you're not satisfied with what you have. And when you get, what, when you get more, you just spend it on yourself and save a little more and do a little more. And then when it comes time to be generous, well, we just don't have enough. You know, we're just scraping two nickels together. Bless God, we're suffering for Jesus. <laughs> well, that, that's not how God wants you to live. God wants you to have more than enough. Whatever income level we're in, we want, he wants us to have more than enough. Don't love your money more than people. Don't love your money more than God. In fact, prosperity in and of itself is almost irrelevant if it's not attached to a purpose. And the problem is so many Christians, so many people in general, but Christians in particular, do not understand their purpose. And so money really is just, it's irrelevant because they don't understand what to do with it. When you understand God gave you money with a purpose to increase you, then you know what to do. I'll never forget when Trish and I got a hold of this, just as young Christians. I was not brought up in church. Uh, we were creasters at best. So does that mean you go on Christmas and Easter? We, went, we were creasters sometimes. My mother went to church. God bless her heart. But none of, my dad didn't want to go, and us kids only went because they dressed us up on Easter and made us look cute. When we got older, we didn't go. I wasn't saved. It was just like going anywhere. It didn't really mean anything to me. So when I got a hold of this, got saved at 31 years old, and we heard we're supposed to tithe, we just started tithing. We just started giving. We just were a blessing, went on mission trips, did all kinds of things. God said, I want you to go help, us, help start a church. Six years into this, just barely finishing Bible school, we transferred jobs, moved to a different city, and helped start a church. We weren't even on staff. Now, I'm not saying that's your story. That's our story. But one thing I know, regardless of what your story is, regardless of what God has called you to prosper in, he wants you to be able to use it to be able to be flexible. The Bible says that the heart of a king is in the hands of the Lord, and like the rivers of water, he turns it where he wants to. Are you ready to release what God has given so that you can let him flow through you? I said last week that we're conduit. We're just a conduit. God wants to flow through us to minister to other people. And if we're all stopped up, come on, somebody. We're just gaining weight, and we ain't helping nobody. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. You know what prosperity does? It highlights our vulnerabilities and exposes our weaknesses. Period. 
If you can't live on what you have now, if you doubled it, you wouldn't live on what you had then. If you tripled it, you still wouldn't have enough. There are people that, that, that are making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year that don't have a dollar in the bank. Awful quiet in here. Now, I'm not condemning you. If, if you've gotten yourself in trouble, how many know there's freedom? But see, today is the day of decision. Today is the day to start honoring God and stop living in the same way that we've been living. If we don't have a purpose, if we don't understand why God gives us money, first of all, to be a blessing, that's first, number one. And then also to provide for our families. Again, we're a conduit of generosity, committed to the cause of Christ so that God can bring blessings in our lives, our family, our health, our relationship with God, our studies, our finances, our position, our purpose. But if God brings us to a point where he wants to start to bless us and we just kind of stop, God is not going to be able to flow through us the way he wants to. See, a heart surrendered to God recognizes the need to live beyond our personal desires and to surrender to God's will in every area of our lives. Romans 12, 1. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Some translations say a living sacrifice, but I like the way the message puts it. Just our normal walking around life. Some of us with new tennis shoes are just walking around in a little more comfort today. But... God wants us to serve him in our ordinary life every day, in every way. Galatians 2.20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I will live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. All right? You are filled with potential, but the self is destructive. You thrive in the presence of God. Self thrives in the absence of God. You have limitless potential, but self has limitations. You are human, but self is humanist. What does that mean? You trust in your own ability. In fact, James 3, 16, it says, where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. See, when self is in control, it can get out of control. When self occupies the part of you that Christ wants to occupy, we're in trouble. In fact, let's just do this for a moment. We just read that James 3, 16. I want to read just a little bit more of that passage of Scripture. Let's turn to James 3. I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation. Say death to self. <laughs> let's look at this scripture first, now that you've got James 3 marked in your Bible, but let's try this. 2 Timothy 3, 2, read this. 2 Timothy 3, 2. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Describing the last days, do you realize lovers of ourselves and lovers of money is one of the big things that we need to fight against as Christians? What issues in your life are causing self to move to the forefront in your life and forfeiting what God wants to do in your life, the real you? Let me ask you, are you pretending to be somebody else? Are you going to fake it till you make it? The way you dress, the way you do your hair. See, God doesn't want clones. You realize that, don't you? He wants you to be who you were created to be. Don't confuse the God breathed you with the God opposed self. Self is always caring about what other people think about it. Wanting to keep up with the Joneses. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Our life is not about keeping up with the Joneses. Our life is about reaching out to the Joneses. Come on, somebody. And, and, it's, and we need to settle that in our minds. Listen to what it says in um, James chapter 3. I said 3, I meant 4. <laughs> Good thing I knew what I was saying. James chapter 4, look at this. Because the problem is, really, we haven't humbled ourselves and said, God, I want you to use me. I mean, really humbled ourselves and asked God to use us 
to be able to reach out and be a blessing. See, being self-conscious means that you're far too away of yourself. Self is going to keep you, self is going to keep you small and contained. God's plan is to enlarge you to be able to be a vessel to preach the gospel. Christ wants you to see yourself way beyond yourself. See, if you see the world through the eyes of self, your vision is going to be limited. It's going to be skewed. You and I need to start to see our life the way God wants us to see our lives. And let me just say this. I don't care how gifted a person is, how many natural abilities a person has. It's only going to take you so far. You are going to be limited if you don't get self out of the way. And the thing is, you can't just, you can't just forgive yourself. You can't just forget yourself. You need to die to self. It's not something you can kind of, because listen, here's what most of us are doing. We say I've been crucified with Christ, but the problem is we're carrying that dead body around on our backs because we just don't want to let self go. You need to get self die, and you need to bury it. Listen, for a good death, there needs to be a burial so there can be a resurrection. Come on, somebody. And the only way that you and I can start to see our lives the way God sees them is to bury self. And to realize we were put here for something else. We were put here to serve him, to reach out to the lost. See, a self-confident, self-taught, self-made person will limit their potential. I don't care how far they get. It's going to infiltrate your attitude, your spirituality, your humility, your compassion. You'll start to judge other people harshly. You're judging me today. Just smile. So you think, well, pastor, how could you say that? Well, because that's what the Bible says. Our life is not about us. See, self will cause us to use scriptures to keep ourselves and others contained and operating in a false sense of humility that's not even scriptural. If you and I don't realize that God wants to increase us, then we're not going to live the way he wants us to, and we won't release what we have because we think that's all there is. And so we become greedy thinking that we're humble with what we have. But the only way that you and I can fight greed is to die to self. In fact, there's a story of a rich young ruler. I, 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 are you still in James 4? We'll get there in a minute. All right. I promise. I promise. Why don't you look over here with me, um, Mark chapter 10. I know I'm having you move all around there, Nath. Nathan, thank you so much. New Living Translation, Mark chapter 10, verse 17. It says, as Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus asked. Only good, or God is truly good. But to answer your question, he says this, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone, honor your father or your mother. Teach the man, or teacher, the man replied. I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him, said there's still one thing you haven't done. He told him, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, at this the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. This doesn't mean we can't have stuff, but he couldn't release them. I love this story because he was feeling pretty good about himself. Oh, teacher, what, what commandments must I keep to inter- inherit eternal life? He thought he had it because Jesus said, well, you know, you, you know the, the commandments. He says, I've kept them since my youth. Oh, but there's one thing. Say one thing. Okay. Well, Jesus sent me here this morning just to kind of step on that one thing that some of us won't let go of. And every one of us has an opportunity when it comes to prosperity to ask God to show us areas where we have not been willing to let go, where we have trusted self more than God. In fact, there's another story, we're not going to read it in Luke chapter 18, where you see a Pharisee and a tax collector. They're coming and praying, and the Pharisee's all proud and, and boastful. And see, that's what religion will do to us. But God wants us to be humble. And the problem is there's two parts to humility that we don't understand. There's two parts to humility. This is where I want to kind of leave us today. One part is to draw near to God. The other part is to resist the devil. All right? So if we're going to be truly humble people, not only do we draw near to God, but we allow God to start to show us how to think so we can resist the enemy. 
We could come to a service like this and we could humble ourselves. We could pray. We could be truly sorry for maybe areas that we haven't been honoring God. But if we don't start to resist the enemy in those areas, we're going to miss what God has for us. For you and I, we have got to stop believing in ourselves and start trusting in God. In James 23, 12, he says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. See, a religious spirit will take that scripture and make it negative and try to bring you down. But see, the spirit of Jesus wants to compel you to go up. I believe with all my heart that true humility is seeing yourself the way God sees you in Christ. Oh, we need to humble ourselves. Don't misunderstand me. We don't run around with pride and and arrogance, but we need to see how God sees us. Now I want to read James chapter 4. I'm going to have the worship team come up here. James chapter 4, verse 1, he says, What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want and you don't have, so you scheme and you kill to get it. You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and you wage war and you take it away from them. You don't have because, or what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you do ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. Pleasure is the enemy of generosity. That doesn't mean God doesn't want us to enjoy life. Don't misunderstand me. But pleasure is the enemy of generosity. If if all we're living for is our own pleasure, we are going to have a problem humbling ourselves before God. Verse 4, you adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. What do you think the scriptures mean when you say the spirit of God is placed within us, is filled with envy? But he gives even more grace to stand against such evil desires. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud but favors the humble. Verse 7, that's where I want to get. So humble yourselves before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. See, pleasures and comfort and the world is the enemy of generosity. Now, I waited on purpose this morning to take our general offering until this portion of the service. If you're a guest here, there's no obligation for you to give to this ministry. We didn't do this to try and get more money. I really believe that God spoke to us before service this morning and that there's many of us who are trusting what we have in our hands. In fact, I'm going to... I'm going to have the ushers in just a moment as we worship, have them pass the baskets as we're worshiping. Listen, there is nothing wrong with just passing the basket to the next person. But make sure you're being obedient to God. Maybe you're here this morning and you're holding on to that $5 so tight that it's got your fingerprints in it. Maybe it's time to release. I don't know. I don't know where you are. Maybe it's $5,000. Maybe it's $500,000. I don't know. (laughs) Woo! Come on, somebody. Maybe you're here this morning and and you know there's areas in your life where you haven't seen God flowing. Not everything is is, is attached to money. Don't misunderstand me, but this morning, I believe, as God is calling us to be generous, that we need to be able to reach out and reach in and give what God has given to us. Now, next week, we're going to kick off Our church has left the building, and we're putting together backpacks filled with books and supplies for kids in foster care. we got 100 backpacks that a member of our church donated that we're going to have you fill, and we'll tell you more about it next week. But this morning, I want us to look at what God has given us and be willing to allow God to break chains of bondage, of poverty. So many of us have a a, a poverty-stricken spirit. We hold on to what we have so tightly because that's all we've ever known. God wants you to start to release. And sometimes we'll think, well, you know, I, I just got saved. Listen, you got saved and called. There's a purpose, God. Saved you and I. And so I want you to take time this morning 
In fact, I'm going to ask you, Chad and the ushers, don't pass the baskets right away. I want, I want us to pray and to think about what it is that God wants to do in our lives today. And Maybe you're here and maybe you've already written out a check or whatever it is. Maybe you've come prepared to give. Then give what you've prepared to give. But if God starts to speak to your heart and wants to do something different, listen, don't come to a service like this and leave bound in the same way that you came. If this is speaking to you today, then declare your freedom because there's prosperity and there's freedom and there's power in the name of Jesus Christ. So don't stay here this morning and leave unchanged. If you're trusting your success, if you're trusting your bank account, if you've never been generous at all, then God, I believe, is speaking to you specifically. Some people give online. If you want to give online, you can do that way. It doesn't have to be in this service. But listen, here's what has to happen. A decision needs to be made that I am not going to live poverty-stricken anymore. I am not going to live trusting only my abilities. I am not going to live holding on to what I have and not being generous with what God has given me because it's for this cause that I have come to this place today to be used as a blessing to preach the gospel. So don't just sit in your seat. Don't don't leave unchanged. Maybe you're here this morning and maybe there's an area in your life where you just you haven't been able to forgive somebody. You haven't you've had someone mistreat you. You've had a, a job opportunity go south or or whatever the case may be or maybe you've racked up a lot of debt or something. Listen, God forgives you. God wants to help you, but start today honoring God with what he's given you and I believe God wants to break the power of debt break the power of poverty and start to teach us to live a prosperous life and if you want that today then shout hallelujah in this place oh there's power in the name of jesus oh there is there is there is we're so glad you stopped by the website today we pray the teaching you just listened to impacts you in a way that helps you on your spiritual journey please take time to check out the rest of the website It is full of information about our church, as well as resources to help you in your walk with Christ. If you have not already attended one of our worship services, we hope you make time to visit us in the near future. Everything we do here is designed with you in mind. The Bible says your real life is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All of our activities point to one thing, our mission statement. Real people living real life with a real God who has the answers.